one man's trash is another man's treasure. That's what my mom always said every Tuesday and Friday when she'd take me to go yard sailing with her. And we did that every summer in my younger years. I must admit, it was kind of interesting to see what other people had for sale. I had some really cool toys back then. G.I. Joe's, Legos. I even found a complete Rock'em Sock'em robot game one time. I still have it upstairs in my closet. I love that game. Anyway, Mom used to find some nice stuff too. Purses, shoes, knickknacks, you know, Mom stuff. And she used to get stuff for Dad also. Now, as I got older, in addition to Tuesdays and Fridays, we would go shopping, as my Mom put it. Every Sunday evening, the night before trash pickup, we would ride around town in Dad's truck. Dad stayed home. Shopping really wasn't his thing. Anyway, we'd ride around town in Dad's truck and see what people were throwing away in their trash. Dressers, tables, bed frames, all kinds of stuff. Some of it was in good condition. Some of it needed a little work and, well, some of it was really trash. Mom and I would bring home the good stuff. Dad would refinish it and they would either keep it or sell it at their own yard sale. It was a great way to make extra cash. Now, as I grew into adulthood, I kept the same family tradition. I go yard sailing every chance I get and bring home furniture from the side of the road. And I've also taken to wandering through random wooded areas in search of new treasures. And three months ago, I found one. No, I mean really found one. Well, what I found first brought sadness to my heart, but what came after made me smile. You see, I was on my way home from work. I'm a linesman for North Providence Telephone Company. Who cares about that? Anyway, I was driving home in my beat-up Mazda 626. There was an accident further up the road causing traffic to come to a standstill. It was like 100 degrees outside. My car didn't have air conditioning, and after being outside most of the day, I had enough of the heat. I slowly turned right onto the shoulder of the road, which you really shouldn't do, and made a right at the next intersection. It was a longer drive to get home. The air was still hot, but at least I wasn't sitting still in it. Anyway, I came upon a patch of trees that I'd been wanting to explore but couldn't find the time. It was a huge patch of trees. As I approached it, I thought, oh, what the hell, I ain't doing anything tonight. Why not? So I put my foot on the brake and pulled over onto the grass right before the trees. I put the car in park and turned it off. I opened the glove box, pulled out my flashlight as I didn't know how long I'd be in there and it'd be getting dark in about an hour or so. I got out of the car, shut the door, and hit the alarm button on my key ring. That way I could hit the alarm button when I'm done searching and hopefully hear the car beep so I can find it again by following the sound. Anyway, I walked in and began looking around. There was a strange thickness in the air. It was still hot, but a little cooler in the trees. I walked around for about half an hour, finding only an old John Deere hat an old weathered shoe, and a broken pair of sunglasses. The sun was starting to descend at that point. I flipped on my flashlight and continued looking around. I walked for about 20 minutes, finding absolutely nothing. I was just about ready to give up when I heard a noise to my right. I quickly turned in that direction. For a split second, I could have sworn I saw someone standing by a tree. I blinked my eyes and the figure was gone. Then I saw it. I didn't know what it was at first. I just knew it was big. I held the light on it as I walked up to it. Oh my God, it's a car, I thought. No way. How did it even get in here? The car was totally demolished. Broken windows, flat tires, dents all over it and graffiti everywhere, but the doors and seats were still intact. The seats were shredded, but they were still intact. 
the keys still in the ignition. I couldn't tell what kind of car it was from all the damage. I walked around it, tripping on a tree root and almost falling on my face. I got to the passenger side, opened the back door, and shined my light in to find nothing out of the ordinary. Styrofoam cups, candy wrappers, and fast food containers mostly. I then went to the front door, opened it, and sat down on the front seat. There was nothing out of the ordinary there either. Old cigarette butts in the ashtray, a soda can in the cup holder, and a book of matches on the floor. Now, I don't know what told me to do this, but something told me to look in the glove box. So I did. I opened it up, and the door fell to the floor, along with a few old napkins, some ketchup packets, and a cassette tape with the words, Play Me, on it. It's still inside a plastic tape case. Now, we've all seen that movie where this guy or gal, I really can't remember, finds a videotape in the closet of their new home with the same words on it. They play it, then all kinds of crazy shit happens. You know what I'm talking about, right? Anyway, I'm not gonna lie. I thought about just leaving it there because that movie totally freaked me out. But this was the most mysterious and coolest thing I ever found. Ah, oh, fuck it. I'm taking it, I thought. I got an old boombox somewhere in the garage that can play this thing. Anyway, I took it, put it in my pocket, and got out of the car, shut the door, hit the alarm button on my keys, and heard the car beep about 20 feet to my left. I walked to my car and drove home. I found the old boombox and listened to the tape. I couldn't believe what I heard. I took the liberty of transcribing the tape word for word. It took me about half an hour to do so. So here it is. Sometimes in life, you just get tired of being who you are, being what you are. So you change it. I mean, if you don't like your job, you get a new one, right? If you don't like a certain thing about yourself, you change it, right? Well, that's what I did. I struggled for the first year or so. Temptation lay in wait around every corner, but I did it. I finally put my past behind me, or so I thought. You see, over the past 12 years, I've seemed to keep the demons of my past at bay until tonight. What happened tonight brought everything back to the surface. Now, before I get started, let me tell you a little about myself. My name is Yark. Go ahead. Make fun of me if you like. I know. Yark the Dark. Ha ha. Very funny. Now that you've had your amusement for the day, let's move forward, shall we? Now, in case you didn't know, Yark is an old Irish name. My grandmother and my grandfather on my father's side were born in Ireland. I don't know anything about my other set of grandparents. Now, shortly after the marriage, my grandparents moved here to the good old U.S. of A. Most likely, it was my grandfather's decision. My grandmother probably had no say in the matter. Marriages were different back then. Anyway, my grandfather got an apprenticeship position with the watchmaker here. He then took the knowledge that he learned over the years. I assume he opened up a shop of his own. Soon after doing so, it was announced that my grandmother was with child. For those of you that don't know what the term with child means, it's an old term by saying a woman is with child means that she's pregnant. Anyway, my father was born nine months later. Now, at the age of 19, my father married a woman two years his senior named Emily. The marriage only lasted a few years, five to be exact, citing unreconcilable differences as the cause of divorce. In that five-year span of time, my mother and father only produced one thing that is noteworthy. Me. Although I am Irish, I carry none of the accent. Now, after the divorce, I apparently went to go live with my father, 
when I was three, and from what I have discovered through research, I was shipped off to the Bennington School for Boys soon after, citing uncontrollable outbursts and behavioral problems as the reason why. In case you're wondering, I researched myself on Ancestry.com. That's how I found all this out. I can hardly remember anything about my mother or father. After my mother practically abandoned me and my father stuck me in that god-awful place, I have no desire to want to talk to either of them. Anyway, around the age of five, I discovered that I was, well, a unique child. Unique. Yeah, that's a good name for it. Let's just leave it at that. Now, as you can probably already imagine, I was quite a handful as a child, always getting into fights from which I had always won, hiding food in my locker, chewing with my mouth open, among many other things. Things that drew much concern in the authority figures of the school. So much so that the majority of my stay there, I was placed in solitary confinement as I was clearly different from the other boys. I found out shortly before my release that when the authorities found out about my uniqueness, they decided that it would be best to keep it under wraps, so to speak, in fear of a scandal. They kept me locked away and fed me scraps and water only. Now, when I turned 18, I was released from the boys' school and thrown out into the world, knowing only the basics of survival to keep me alive. My behavior pattern continued to get worse, and I was arrested many times for many different offenses. The last time I was in jail... I met a man who once went through what I was going through, only different. He taught me how to control my impulses and turn them into positive things instead of negative ones. He completely changed my life. When I got out of jail, my impulses were still strong, though. Now, I must admit, I fell off the wagon a few times in the beginning but pulled myself together and became the person that I am now, or was. I got a job at a little diner-type restaurant named Chelsea's as a busboy when I was 23. It didn't pay much, but it paid enough to where I could rent a room at the local flop house just down the street from the restaurant. That's where I met my wife, at Chelsea's, not the flop house. Anyway, I was clearing one of the tables, putting the dishes into a large gray tote. I was the only busboy that night. The other guy called out, so I was trying to hurry. When I finished wiping the table, I grabbed the tote, turned around quickly, and ran directly into her, causing her to scream and fall back against the table, and causing me to drop the tote, breaking all of the dishes and glasses. Oh my God, are you all right? I asked her nervously and concerned. She then looked at me with the most beautiful ocean blue eyes that I had ever seen. Yes, I'm, I'm fine, she said, smiling. You just startled me. I'm so sorry, I responded, picking up the tote. My boss is going to kill me, I said as the other three girls walked by, giggling. Janice, you coming or what? One of them said. I'll be right there. She responded, smiled, and waved her hand and mouthed bye to me. She then went to join her friends at the table. As if I wasn't embarrassed enough, I had to walk past their table to get to the kitchen area so I could drop off my tote. I took a deep breath, let it out, and began walking. As I passed their table, I heard one of the girls say, Go for it, Janice. He's cute. Then they all giggled. Anyway, I walked in the kitchen area and told my boss what happened. She just laughed. We have plenty more in storage, she said. I smiled and went back to work. About 45 minutes later, I was clearing another table when Janice came walking up to me. Hi, I'm Janice, she said. Here's my number. Call me. And handed me a folded piece of napkin. I'm York, I responded. I will. Yark, she said. Cool name. 
She then smiled, waved, mouthed by again, and then left, turning back just before she walked out the door and waved once again. I called her the next day. We started dating, and we were married a year later. I'm sorry for babbling. I, I just love to tell that story. Now, as I said, we were married a year later. We stayed with her parents in a small basement apartment until I saved enough money to rent an actual apartment. Two years after that, we had our first child. We decided to name him Stephen. Two years after that, we had our second child, this time a girl. We decided to name her Autumn. During that time, I got promoted to host, which paid a lot more than busboy and bought a car. Janice got a job as a librarian's assistant and bought a car as well. As time went on, we saved what little money we could, having two toddlers and all, and eventually bought a small three-bedroom ranch-style house in town. Life was going great. I was married to an incredibly beautiful woman. I had two wonderful children, a nice house, and a decent-paying job. Until tonight. Tonight, everything went to shit. Now, they say that the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and that statement is absolutely true. My intention was good, protect my wife and family the only way I knew how, but in doing so, cause the hell I'm in right now, mentally speaking, that is. You see, last night was family night out, dinner and a movie. We took her car, I drove, we both have a set of keys for each other's car. We had dinner at Texas Roadhouse and saw Shark Boy and Lava Girl in the theater. Everyone was having a good time. On the way home, we stopped for gas. We could have made it home, but I don't like letting the tank get below a quarter. Stopping for gas is a decision I now regret. We pulled up to the pump. Janice had to use the bathroom, and the kids wanted to look around, so we all went in. I held the door for them all. The kids went in first, then Janice, then me. Janice beelined for the bathroom. The kids hit the snack aisle as I went to the counter to pay. I know what you're thinking. Why didn't he just use his debit card at the pumps? Well, that's because I don't have one. I don't trust banks. If I can't pay cash for it, I don't need it. Anyway, a few minutes went by. The cashier finished up with the customer in front of me. Then it was my turn. As I was about to say, I need 30 on 5, the door chime went off, and a deep male voice yelled, Everyone down on the ground, or you're all dead, as he fired two shots into the ceiling. I heard my kids scream. I turned to my right and screamed, Get down! I felt those impulses start building. I turned back around to see the barrel of the handgun pointed directly at my forehead. I said, Get down, he said, putting the barrel against my skin. Give me the money, he screamed to the cashier as the sound of him fumbling with the register soon followed. I just stood there, not afraid at all. I'm not going to ask, he began to say. In mid-sentence, I heard Janice scream from the back of the store. The guy then turned the gun away from me and pointed it at Janice. Get over here, bitch, he screamed as he began walking toward her, gun raised and tilted. Now, it's one thing to put a gun in my face. It's a whole different ball game when you threaten my wife with one. I turned to the cashier and whispered, get down and stay down. Now, those impulses that I mentioned earlier, well, they came to the surface. I felt my eye sockets shift and my vision became masked and crimson. I felt my skeletal frame and all of my muscles begin to morph into what I truly am. The black hair began piercing my skin as it grew and covered my entire body, ripping my clothes in the process. 
My nose and teeth were replaced with a long snout and fangs. My ears shifted to the top of my head. My hands and feet began claws. As I dropped down on all fours, I let out a blood-curdling growl. The full transformation took mere seconds to complete. The guy then turned the gun around as I reared back. He fired his last four shots directly into my chest as I pounced on him, causing him to drop the gun. The bullets did nothing. They didn't even hurt. Only a silver bullet can kill a werewolf. Anyway, I ripped his entire face off with one bite. Blood was everywhere. I began tearing his body limb from limb. Then I heard Jenna scream. I stood and looked at her. A blanket of fear covered her face. I stepped over the mutilated body and took a step towards her. Get away from me, you monster, she screamed. Kids, don't look. Let's go. She quickly gathered the kids and ran out of the door screaming. All I could do was watch. Before they left, I saw my children. My children look at me with fear in their eyes. I would never hurt my children or my wife, ever. I was protecting them. I quickly transformed back and ran to the door to see Janice and my kids peeling away from the gas pump. My heart was completely broken. I was protecting you, I whispered and hung my head. I was protecting you, as tears filled my eyes. I then heard sirens blaring in the distance. I looked up to see the cashier standing behind the counter. He pointed toward the back. Rear exit, go, he said as the sirens got louder. I ran out of the back door and ran the whole ten-plus miles to our home, hoping to find Janice and the kids there, but they weren't there. All of her clothes and all of the kids' clothes were gone. Our wedding picture that hung on the wall in the living room was smashed to pieces on the floor. A little piece of me died when I saw that. I fell to my knees and cried for what felt like hours. I then got up and walked to our bedroom. I went over to my dresser and pulled out the only thing my mother ever gave me, a small black box. I remember when she gave it to me, outside of the courthouse, she said, you'll know when you have to use this. She ruffled my hair and then she walked off. That was the last time I saw her. I didn't understand it then, but I understand it now. You see, inside the box is a silver bullet. I kept it all these years. I took the bullet out of the box, grabbed the gun that was sitting next to the box, opened the cylinder, and loaded the bullet into it, closed it, and spun it. Then I walked to my car, gun in hand, and drove somewhere. I don't even know where I'm at. Somewhere in a bunch of trees. The gun weighs heavy in my hand. I know what I have to do now. I can't live with the thought that my one true love thinking I'm a monster. I can't live with the memory of the fear that covered my beautiful children's faces. I'm going to find a nice, comfortable spot facing the east and wait for the sun to rise. Janice always liked to watch the sun rise. Then put this bullet to use. Whoever finds the car, you can have it. I already signed the title. I'm recording this on a handheld tape recorder that I'm going to throw out of the window when I'm done in hopes that whoever finds this tape will share my story with as many people as possible. Maybe Janice will hear it, or Stephen, or Autumn, and know that I was only trying to protect them. I'm sorry. I'm so very sorry.
I love you, Janice. I love you, Stephen. I love you, Autumn. Goodbye. That's where the tape ends. Now, I'm not ashamed to admit, the first time I heard it, I cried. I called a buddy of mine, whose father owns a towing service in an auto repair shop. I had him tow the car to the shop. I took two old boards that I had laying around in the yard and made a cross, painted it in white, and wrote Yark on it, and put it in the ground where I found the car after it was towed. I don't know exactly where he died, so I did the best I could. I also found a smashed handheld tape recorder about 20 feet from where the car was. I kept it and put it in the glove box. I did a little research and come to find out there was a suicide that happened in those woods back in 2003. Police reports stated that the victim's name was York O'Brien, identified by the driver's license in his wallet. Now, I sunk every bit of money I had into restoring the car, and come to find out, that massive heap of junk was actually a 1967 Ford Mustang hardtop. My dream car. I know, right? It took them two months to completely restore it. I had it painted candy apple red with flames on the side, like I always wanted. I also got a vanity plate from the DMV, that simply says for Yark on it. My buddy's father gave me a discount since I let him use the before and after pictures on his sales flyers. I've been driving it around for about a month now. I donated my Mazda to the local Salvation Army. During the two months that they were fixing it up, I shared this story on Facebook, Twitter, and let everyone I possibly could listen to the tape, just like Yark had asked. So I figured I'd post it here as well. If you can hear me, wherever you are, I believe you, Yark. You know, sometimes when I'm riding around, I swear out of the corner of my eye, I see someone sitting in the passenger seat that looks exactly like the figure I saw in the woods when I found the car. But when I turn my head, they're gone. I can't help to think, but that it's Yark. Now, I still go yard sailing, I still pick up furniture on the side of the road, and it makes me happy doing so. But nothing makes me happier when I'm riding down some back road and playing the radio with York riding shotgun. <laughs>